So, see, when you talk about the COVID-19 infection, what are the basic tests you need to do? You actually start with the CDC, a coagulation fibrinolysis assay, that's PT, APT, D-dimer, fibrinogen. You often look for the inflammatory related markers, which are like ESR, CRP, fibrinogen, Procal, LFT and KFT. The basic, basic usual tests you often ask a patient to be done. Is it actually required? Let's understand that. Now, when you do a CBC, because you know, you cannot diagnose the disease without a routine CBC. So often, a clinician is always uh, going for a routine test like a RT-PCR. And if the fever is persisting, he would all actually ask the patient to go for a CBC. What you expect in a CBC is leukocytosis, lymphopenia, and that lymphopenia often has a neutrophilia so with it. And hence, we call this elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, NLR. Okay. Thromocytopenia is a common finding, but this finding, thromocytopenia, and the finding below it, so thromocytopenia, decreased eosinophils, and decreased hemoglobin, you expect these three findings, the last three findings, at a more severe or a bit later stage of a disease. So what do you expect initially? I can make it very clear to you. So what you must expect here is the first one, second one, and the third one to be really be there in a patient of COVID-19 infection. What do you expect in your biochemical markers are elevated liver enzymes. You expect a high bilirubin. You expect renal impairment. You expect hypoalbuminemia and acroid derangements. So today, I'll talk about every, every parameters. Why do they increase? What makes them increase? And when do you expect them to decrease? In a conceptual way. Let's start with it. Blood glucose in COVID-19. Remember, this is a very, very important statement. I have just read a lot of articles um, and actually proving the fact that even in a non-diabetic patient, even in a non-diabetic patient, please understand, regardless of whether the patient has diabetes or not, a fasting hyperglycemia is an independent, poor prognostic marker. So you should be able to understand that this is the first one very, very important here. Fasting hypoglycemia is one poor pronostic marker for the COVID-19 infections. Well, let's talk about why we have today as we have come together. We have come to understand the inflammation of COVID-19, how does it occur and why do they actually increase the markers. So let me talk about the mild disease. What happens there? Think what happens in a mild disease is, we talk about a mild disease. So in a mild disease, there go. In a mild disease, see, if this is a COVID-19 infection, let's assume this is a type 2 pneumocytes. So what happens, the COVID-19 viruses, they actually enter the type 2 pneumocytes. And when they enter this, they actually start increasing the proliferation in the type 2 pneumocytes and they enter it by the ACE2 receptors. So once the virus have entered the type 2 pneumocytes, what happens, they actually start proliferating here. And you would remember a phenomenon called as pyroptosis. While the virus causes proliferation of the its own uh, virus particles with the help of the host machinery, it also causes apoptosis or as you say paraptosis of the type 2 nemocytes here. The moment there's a type 2 nemocyte paraptosis, what happens? That what happens here is these all nemocytes will actually increase or release out the viral particles. The moment the viral particles are releasing out from here, these viral particles that are released out is picked up by the alar macrophages, which you also call as the Aral macrophages, which you also call as the dust cells, dust macrophages. So what happens? This macrophage that has actually taken up these cells, the mac the macrophage that has taken up these cells, what they do is they first try to engulf the COVID-19 infection and then they start presenting it to the other cells. At the same time, the macrophage releases various interleukins. The various interleukins that the virus release, just a second, please. They go. The various Markers that these virus will release here, these all are very, very important. And what are those? They release IL-1 and they release IL-6. These IL-1 and IL-6 are very important markers because they actually will activate the B cells. They actually activate the B cells. The B cells are activated in this phenomenon to release the antibodies against the viral infection. But one more important fact is these virus will also activate the neutrophils and monocytes in the around capris, around the alloy. So this is a capri. So what happens? These macrophages releasing this IL-1 and IL-6 and IL-8, they'll activate the neutrophils here. Neutrophils, after getting activated, they'll first damage the endothelium. These all endothelium are actually damaged. And neutrophils are also coming back to the uh, ally. Just what happens in a case of ARDS. Remember ARDS? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what happens because that is when they actually are actually getting inside this and are basically uh, coming in this area, neutrophils again release more and more cytokines. 
but this is a new normal phenomenon which occurs in any mild disease okay so what we understood now the sars cov in virus they actually enter the type 2 pneumocytes with the help of ace2 they cause paraptosis of this type 2 pneumocytes and when they come out they come out as more and more virus particles these virus particles are picked up by the macrophages which release various cytokines to activate b cells they also activate the neutrophils which actually enter this area but please understand because it's a viral infection the viral infection will actually cause increase of lymphocytes which may be t cells more than the b cells more than the neutrophils so what i want to tell you here is lymphocytes are the main cells actually accumulating in this area this all area will have more and more lymphocytes basically because lymphocytes start infiltrating lymphocytes they start infiltrating this area the lymphocytes start accumulating in this area and that is why we find lymphopenia in these patients there's leukocytosis because the more neutrophil increasing here neutrophil is increasing here and lymphocytes because they enter more and more into the amyloid amyloid the number of lymphocytes starts decreasing in the blood so you find relative lymphopenia and you find neutrophilia you find neutrophilia okay now having understood this then you see what happens remember endothelial cells has got activated only so in type in in the mild disease this is only activation of the endothelial cells let's put this to the severe disease what happens in severe disease you know, see it's a very complex diagram what happened what is happening here is again the same phenomenon the sars cov has entered the type 2 pneumocytes type 2 pneumocytes releasing the sars cov 2 and they are picked up by the macrophage macrophage is now releasing huge amount of il1 and il6 so the activation of the new uh, activation of the immune cells is quite more in a severe disease compared to a mild disease now why does a severe disease occur the few predisposing factors which we have been studied like one is the age a uh, old age this immunocompromised status it is diabetes it is morbid obesity it is a lung disease or it can be any type of other comorbid conditions like the kidney disease or any sort of other disease a systemic disease that a patient may have okay so what happens the huge amount of il1 and il6 they not only activate the monocytes neutrophils but they also start activating the neutrophils to release nets i hope you remember nets what is nets net is basically a neutrophil extra cellular traps so these net molecules they want to do is they start putting all the platelets and all the uh, cells towards it at the same time start releasing the enzymes out which enzymes all the microbial enzymes are released out of the neutrophils and because they catch hold of these viruses outside the neutrophil they are called as neutrophil extra cellular traps but what has happened at the same time is there is huge huge amount of endothelial injury and i hope you all know this Warkostrad. Warkostrad has told us here what has happened is that has happened as endothelial injury and this injury has basically activated the Warkos triad. What is Warkos triad? Warkos triad say that if a patient has endothelial injury, he has turbulence or abnormal blood flow or he has hypercalcity of blood. This all will lead to thrombosis. So what happens because of the endothelial injury here, what has activated is the thrombo, I will say thrombogenic uh, potential has actually been activated here. So what you see in the chronic disease is number one, this huge amount of cytokines. Number two, there's endothelial injury. And number three, there's activation of the coagulation cascade. But remember friends, our body is unique. The moment there is any pathology, our body will always activate the physiology also. So what our body does is, it starts to break all the clots. And the, to break the clot, what our body and endothelium releases is the streptokinase and the urokinase. These two molecules, which actually are the kinases, they start breaking the clot. The moment a clot breaks, what comes out is the fibrin and the fibrin degrade products, which we'll understand in the future cause of disease. So, what we understand from a mild and severe is a severe disease will have more cytokines, more cytokines, more activation of the coagulation and cascade, and will have more uh, systemic features compared to a normal disease. So, what is a patient having? Because the patient is having the endothelial injury, the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide and the oxygen exchange in this capillary is decreasing. And that is why the patient has hypoxemia and hypoxia. Not to forget, the fluid can also enter this allies. That will cause huge amount of edema in this area. This will cause huge amount of edema in this whole area. And it will cause pulmonary edema, which can be seen on the x-ray 
or can be seen on the CT scan as a ground glass apparatus. The basic pathophysiology of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Acute respiratory distress syndrome. Let's move forward now. What happens? They go. Now, in this image, I have just put the same thing with a small difference that this image is showing you all the SARS CoV 2 entering the type 2 lymphocytes, causing pyroptosis. So, again, releasing it out, picked up the macrophage. Macrophage is representing it to the monocytes, NK cells, and the CD4 and CD8 cells. At the same time, it is releasing huge amount of cytokines with it. Now, what has happened is comes the macrophage. Now, who can forget the macrophage? The M1 macrophage and the M2 macrophage. Remember, a basic rule of pathology. Whenever there is an inflammation, the macrophage, who is the Bahubali of the entire body, starts getting activated. Do you remember the M2 macrophage? They are the ones which not only cause anti inflammation, but they also start causing repair. And what is repair? Repair means a start of a small amount of fibrosis in the entire area. So the M2 macrophage start causing fibrosis in the entire ally. So this is a healing phase. It's a healing phase. Okay. So initially what happened? There was injury. Next what happened? Proliferation of the cells. And third what happened? There is fibrosis of the ally. Not to forget this huge amount of coagulation cascade activation in the uh, capris around the ally. That is the alar capris has activated the coagulation cascade. So based on this knowledge, let's start understanding the cytokine storm and how to identify this and what are the parameters you can look into this whole situation. See, normally our immune activation is always good and it actually prevents our body. This activation becomes overwhelming when the body is not able to remove the virus particle. It's just like you are studying for say two hours a day and you suddenly feel Two hours is not working. What to do is you study for 10 hours a day. So that is like a storm. Suddenly you are working for 10 hours a day. Your body feels, oh my God, what has happened? The same thing, this is actually working in the body. The virus is, has entered our body. Our body is raising some cytokines, basically to remove all the viruses. But what has happened at the same time is our body has an overwhelming cytokine infection. That overwhelming cytokine increasing is called a cytokine storm. How to identify this? We will discuss this in the upcoming lecture and that is how we understand the general pathology here. See, interleukin-6, you understood, was the main cytokine increasing, releasing from the alveolar macrophages. This interleukin-6, they activate the liver cells. The liver cells are the ones which release complements, mannose binding proteins, fibrinogen, serum amyloid and the C-reactive protein. What are they together called? Yes, you guessed it correct. They are called as acute phase reactant. They are called as acute. They are called as acute phase reactants. Okay. They are called as acute phase reactants. Now see, understand these all markers of proteins are not just for show. They have some unique functions and we'll discuss this one by one under a topic called as the timeline of acute phase reactants. It's very, very important slide. See, as a general practitioner, when you practice medicine, you must be aware of the facts that when do you expect a particular marker to increase after an infection? So this is a good uh, diagram to show that. Look at the x-axis given as markers on the time frame. So these are hours, okay? Like the 0th hour, 6th hour, 12th hour, 18th hour, and 24th hour. Now, if you understand how are the markers increasing, you must focus on this pink color marker here. Look at the pink color marker. This marker is called as CRP. Now you look, the CRP is a marker increasing the maximum concentration at which time? Look at the time. It is just under two days, 28 hours. Well, who comes next? Comes the blue one. And who is the blue one? Let's see down. It is ferritin. Now, this molecule is ferritin. Now, if you ask me, so when will ferritin peak? It will peak after four days. So, at the two days, what increases is CRP. On four days, what increases is the ferritin. Other markers are usually not done, but yes, one marker you expect in the liver function tends to decrease is a negative acute phase reactant and that is called as albumin. So yes, look at the albumin here, the light blue one, the light blue one albumin is this marker here, it's decreasing here. Okay, so albumin is this marker and the level has decreased because it's actually is a negative acute phase reactant. Okay, so we have got a basic knowledge that CRP will rise on the second day, ferritin will rise on the fourth day. And the marker of albumin should decrease if we mess measure this in a patient who is having inflammation. Okay. So now a few things are correct. Few things we have already understood. Number one, there's definitely increase in cytokines. Second, cytokine activates the liver cells to release some acute phase reactants. And not to forget, in the vessel capris, that 
actually has an initiation of coagulation cascade. With that coagulation cascade, our body is trying to remove that by activating the five renolytic mechanisms. Okay, let's move forward now. Dekho. Let's start it one by one. Let's understand each and every molecule CRP. Basically, we talk about CRP. You all know one thing. You know where from where the, the word C comes. The C word comes from the C polysaccharide of the pneumococcus. Basically, what happened? It is quite, you just, if you are interested in the history, what happened in 1931, few scientists were working on a patient who was actually got infected with the pneumococcus and they observed that in a patient of pneumococcus infection, some proteins are increasing. They actually understood those proteins are actually reacting, especially against the pneumococcal protein of the bacteria. And hence they called it C-reactive protein. Now, when you look at its name, it will really confuse you. So C-reactive protein means it must actually only and only react against pneumococcus but that is a wrong statement it actually should that statement is completely undermining the importance of c-active protein so c-active protein being an active reactant they have numerous functions and one of the very very important one is to activate remember they bind to polysaccharide and they activate the c1q which you remember c1q is a classical it's a classical complement pathway so yes one of the most important role, please understand, one of the most important role of the uh, C-reactive protein is to activate the complement pathways. Now remember one thing, C-reactive protein has other functions also, like it has complement pathway activation, it causes apoptosis of the cells, phagocytosis, release of nitric oxide and cytokine production. So yes, cytokine has released CRP, CRP in turn again releases cytokine production. These all are the roles of CRP. So please understand, let's not undermine the basic role of CRP in saying it only reacts against pneumococcal protein. It's an undermining statement. Let's not call that. The basic role are all of those. So now we understand the CRP is increasing in inflammation. But why should you look this marker at the beginning of the patient? That means the moment you diagnose a patient of COVID-19, always go for a test of CRP to establish a baseline value. Why? Because CRP is not only increased in the inflammation, CRP is also increased in some comorbid conditions like acute kidney injury, virus thromboembolism, critical illness, and if a patient has been hospitalized before, that means even if a patient has say hypertension or diabetes, he has some morbid obesity or he has some venous thromboembolism conditions, he has some chronic illness, CRP will surely increase beforehand. So unless you don't establish your baseline value, you will never be able to understand the value of CRP is increasing or decreasing. That means let's assume you got a CRP value of 50. Who knows that even without COVID, the patient had a value of 35. So you can't say the CRP has rose from 0 to 50. So always establish your baseline at the beginning of the patient you have diagnosed. Make sure you diagnose a CRP on the day 4 of the illness, illness and then you start looking for the increase or decrease. So make sure one investigation you must do on the day of diagnosis of a COVID-19 is CRP along with CBC. What are the other tests? Let's see that forward. Till now, if you have any thought process, let me know in the chat group. I'll answer your questions and then also then move ahead. Okay. One more thing about CRP is the T half. Now, you, you may feel, okay, sir, CRP has a T half. You know what? Okay, let me tell you. The CRP has a T half of 19 hours. That means if your patient doesn't have a fever now, do you expect a CRP to straight away come down? No, guys. Till that time, the cytokine is high. After that, at least for two days, the CRP will be higher. Secondly, the rate of CRP rise is highly exponential. And look at the statement. It can rise from 1 to 500 within a matter of just 24 hours to 72 hours. So you must not be surprised to see a patient who is in ICU having a CRP of say 20 to 20 on day one and suddenly has gone to say 100 and above on the day four or day five of illness. One more thing, a CRP value of more than 100 is a real indicator of grave prognosis of the patient. So make sure you should not discharge the patient, discharge a patient, you should not discharge the patient if he has a very, very high value of CRP. Let the CRP come back to normal, not exactly normal, let it come back to raise say 30s or 40s and then you can discharge the patient based on his oxygen requirement. Okay, so if you have any, any um, doubt or any thought that you have, please get me on the telegram group or in the group. Okay, so after what time, very good question from Rishi, after what time a CRP will come down, say, 
if a patient has a fever free interval for three days or if the cytokine level has come down the crp will definitely definitely come down after an interval of two days you don't expect crp to come down on the day of fever free interval okay albumin decreases application on which day but albumin is very initial marker that comes down in a liver function test and that can decrease even on the day two of the illness because albumin is actually a negative reaction reactant and that is when you start decreasing the ag ratio reversal and many of the i've seen many of the residents seeing that ag is reversed in a in this disease and it is pointing towards a chronic liver disease no that's not true in this page in this cases the albumin decreasing is due to the negative active reactant okay so let's move forward now now comes a big marker il6 the biggest question is sir should we do il6 or not let, let, let me understand, make you understand. IL-6 is not the only marker. Had you been in a good setup, you would be actually doing a marker like you should do IL-6, you should do IL-1 and you should also do a TNF-alpha. Well, these three are the basic markers or the main cytokines. Please remember, the main cytokines, the main cytokines, the main cytokines is are the IL-6, IL-1 and the TNF alpha. So what they do is these all cytokines they stimulate the liver to release, they release the active phase reactants. Interleukin 6 is the most important marker which comes from the other macrophages. And remember one thing, the basic role of IL-6 is not only inflammation, but they also have a role in regenerative and anti-inflammatory effects, which will then activate the macrophage. And I hope you can understand the M2 macrophage to initiate the fibrosis. That means the IL-6 is a marker which may be increased quite late in the stage even when the patient has quite decreased his fever. So I won't say IL-6 is one of the very good markers to look for the inflammatory response but IL-6 is one marker which is stimulating the release of CRP. But if you tell me, sir, is IL-6 the only marker? Definitely not. A high IL-6 can be seen with a normal CRP. A high CRP can be seen even with a normal IL-6. How is this possible, sir? I tell you again, it is not only IL-6, it is IL-1 and TNF-alpha, all of these three, which stimulates the liver to release the acute phase reactant. But then I have not asked the main question. So still tell me, why will you find an IL-6 normal in a case who has high CRP? Look at the basic fact, guys. The half-life is just one to three hours. So if you know this fact, you will never confuse yourself. The half-life of IL-6 is 1 to 3 hours and IL-6 is released from the outer macrophages. These macrophages, they release IL-6 and some of the IL-6, they come into the bloodstream. They're called as soluble IL-6. The half-life of a soluble IL-6 is just 1 to 3 hours. So that is quite possible. IL-6 was increased in the night. The patient has an increase in CRP the next morning. He has a CRP of say 76, 78 and your IL-6 is just below 7 is 2.5. So would you say IL-6 is a good marker? What is your impression? Tell me. So I'm putting this thought to you. I'm seeing many of you are actually live here. Tell me, do you now think the IL-6 is a very good marker for looking for the cytokine levels in the patient? How frequently should we go for monitoring CRP levels? After every fourth day, you should go for a CRP level analysis because that will give you a definite good idea as to how the patient is doing, how your patient is doing. So go for the CRP level on day four of illness and then go on day seven of illness and then go on day 14 of illness. So CRP level should be done on day four, day seven and then day 14 of the illness. But make sure the day four is done to establish your baseline levels, to establish your baseline levels. Yes, quite well answered, quite well answered. Uh, by uh, Subhashri Hari that actually IL-6 should not be used as a very good marker. IL-6 may be normal even with the high CRP. Okay, let's come to the other, other markers here. Ferritin. Now, one of the marker which was, you know, initially used to a huge extent was ferritin. Let me tell you why was ferritin used. Ferritin is a supporting, please understand. This is a ferritin. Okay, this molecule, let, let's assume this is a ferritin molecule. The ferritin molecule will basically bind the RN. So, RN iron binds to ferritin. Now see, the basic reason of an increase in ferritin, it's active phase reactant, we all understand. But why is ferritin increasing? The ferritin is increasing to catch hold of iron. If the ferritin is not there, the iron is free and that iron can lead to increase of reactive oxygen species and can lead to ferroprocess. Remember, always a basic rule, a free iron increases reactive oxygen species 
and this causes paraptosis which means cell death by necrosis which means cell death by necrosis see i am seeing all of your questions i can tell you one thing i'll i'll remove every doubt i have after i explained to you each and every marker let me just tell you one mark, one marker one by one and then you will see you will yourself be able to appreciate which is the best marker when should you do it okay so see if there's a free iron in the body if there's a free iron in the body it will lead to peroptosis the peroptosis the peroptosis in these patients that is what will lead to the cell death it will lead to cell death so our body has a unique mechanism our body increases ferritin to decrease the free iron and that causes decreased cell death so the basic role of ferritin is to protect the host cell during infection why how by decreasing r by decreasing rn which is free okay so ferritin is an increase in inflammation but on which day day 4 and onwards but look at the half life it is 30 hours what do you say ferritin was increased in a patient suppose it went to say 600 and the patient has a fever free interval will you expect the value to come back to normal no you won't the ferritin will be quite high for even after 4 to 5 days of the illness why because cytokine which has increased the ferritin all the cytokine doesn't come back to normal after that at least for 2 days the ferritin will not come back to normal so what will decrease first is crp what then comes down is ferritin what increases first crp what then increases ferritin that means the one marker that you must now you have understood crp is one marker you must keep on doing after every 4 days about ferritin lot of studies have not been done but yes what i can tell you is it's a reliably good indicator of the inflammation going on in the bed in the in the uh, person do you expect the ferritin to come back to normal once the patient has a fever free interval you should not expect it you should not expect it the basic role of ferritin is to reduce rn so that rn is not freely available reduce reduce the ros that will lead to reduce reduction in the cell death Yes, it will lead, definitely lead to Fenton reaction. Definitely lead to Fenton reaction. Surely, so days counted is from which day exactly? RT PCR positive. You cannot say you cannot say when the patient has actually gone into other conditions. The only thing we can say is the day of RT PCR positive. So when I say day four, I mean RT PCR positivity day. Okay, sure. Next marker. Well, highly highly dangerous, and you should not look at this as something which can be neglected. Coagulopathies. the basic region of activation of coagulopathy was quite made clear by me in the initial slides of the pathophysiology coagulopathy is really activated in the patient who is having covid-19 infection and the way you can appreciate this is by looking for elevated d dimer i'll talk about this marker a bit later elevated fibrinogen and fdp prolonged pt and increased risk of thrombosis now among them pt is a marker you cannot trust on the pt may still be normal in a patient it may still be normal inr may be normal but what is a marker you must trust on is actually d dimer but i tell you this marker has been highly highly overused and it should not be because the studies of d dimer in a covid 19 is not very clear none of the studies tell you that what is the way you should interpret d dimer the way you should understand d dimer is very important let me tell you what exactly is d dimer dekho what happens is this molecule is strong it's a molecule is fibrinogen when many fibrinogen come together like this it becomes a fibrin network when on fibrin network that means this is factor 1 this becomes factor 1a now when factor 13 acts it brings a cross link look at the cross link here look at the cross link here okay now when the thrombin or plasmin acts on it when the plasmin acts on it it breaks all the single bond here because it breaks a single bond what comes together is a d dimer molecule that means a dimer molecule is formed only when a clot is formed and then lysed only when the clot has formed and then lysed it lead to d dimer formation and therefore one of a reliable marker that a clot has formed and then lysed is d dimer analysis let's come back to the basics now dekho remember risk of severe disease and mortality this is very very important to understand is two fold severe disease is two fold and for mortality it is four fold higher okay that means dimer is definitely correlating to the 
high morbidity and mortality in a patient. Now, should you do, should you do that DMR? It is virtually told that DMR investigation should be done only in the mild, sorry, moderate to severe cases. Only when the patient starts having some oxygen requirement should go for DMR analysis. So why is DMR increased? Because of coagulopathies. Can you trust on PT? No, you can't. Fluorescent molecules is not very easily available. So you may not be able to do that test easily. Now, the biggest problem on DMR is you will see the values as values as sometimes you'll see a value as microgram per ml. You'll see some of the molecules as nanogram per ml. Well, values are confusing. Remember, one microgram per ml is equal to 1000 nanogram per ml. Okay, the null value of redimer is around less than 4, 0 0.4 I should say here, which makes 400 here. A value of less than 4 is normal, less than, sorry, 0 0.4 is normal for microgram per ml and value of less than 400 is normal for nanogram per ml. Clear? So these two molecules should make it in your mind. You should look for the values. Don't look at, say, in the lab. A lab is giving a report of microgram per ml or they may give you a value of nanogram per ml. It is not, not important to change the values, but you should know that there are different labs will be giving different values. Okay. Now, what you can trust? You can trust any of them. But have they been literally studied on COVID? They haven't been. The basic importance of the COVID of this marker is a value of more than one microgram per ml or say 1000 nanogram per ml is an indicator of poor prognosis. Emissions, they often start sclexane, that is low molecular weight heparin, if the molecule, if the molecule has a weight or value of over 3 microgram per ml, that means with more than 3000 microgram per ml, you start low molecular weight heparin. And when you give this, the risk of mortality really comes down. It really comes down. Okay, it really comes down. A high dimer level is often seen with high mortality rate. So often the patients are given the uh, the low molecular weight band, the sclexane is often given to them and should be monitored with again doing a dimer on repeated basis. So dimer should not be a first line investigation, but yes, if a patient is on oxygen requirement, that means his ally are getting damaged. That is when the coagulopathy starts and can go to huge level. Start with a dimer. Look for the values. The value is more than 400. Start repeating it again and again. If it is more than 1000, you should be telling the patient you may go sick but the value is more than 3000 start low molecular weight appearance low molecular weight appearance okay i have few questions here why is clot formed i think you haven't uh, understood the first initial slide of my uh, topic i told you the clot is formed because of the virus itself the virus what the virus does is see what the virus does is yeah what does what happens is let me just come back to this area where i was bring to you what happens here is this virus when it enters this area and cytokine is releasing that cytokine will cause damage to the endothelium because when endothelial damage they activate the work of strat the work of strat is the one which activates the coalition cascade because of endothelial injury why endothelial injury why rn is increased rn is not increased but the high rn can lead to more and more reactive oxygen species so the body will increase ferritin to decrease the rn in whatever form it can one way is to increase the ferritin levels now see let's come back to one more marker procal well procal first of all let me tell you is not an inflammatory marker procal is very important you know a very interesting way of getting released see let me show you this diagram first let's assume this is a PCT production, it's a PCT gene. This, suppose this is a Cal C1 gene. It is on a chromosome number 1. Okay. So what happens? What happens? This Cal C gene is on chromosome number 1. This actually release the procalcitonin. Now what happens in the endocrine cell that is thyroid is when the procal comes, the procal will convert to the calcitonin and then comes into blood. I simply want to tell you is in a thyroid, what happens? The, what I'm trying to tell you is the procal is a gene which makes a procalcitonin. In thyroid cells, what happens? The procalcitonin is converted to the calcitonin and it then comes out into blood. But if you compare this finding to what happens in adipocytes, in adipocytes, what happens? The procalcitonin will not convert to the 
to the calcitonin and the procalc will come into blood. Now, in 99.9% .9 of the procalc, they often come out as calcitonin. But when the patient has an inflammation by bacteria, especially bacteria, the bacterial polysaccharides, they are the ones which will not allow, which will not allow this phenomenon and start increasing this phenomenon, especially in the adipocytes. So what happens? The bacteria, the bacteria, especially the interleukins again, IL-6, TNF alpha, and the light polysaccharide of the bacteria. Okay, look at this. LBS, bacteria or cytokines. What they induce is the pro to go in adipocytes. They don't allow it to go it here, they allow it to go here. And what happens? This procal will not change to the calcitonin. So what comes out into blood is only the procalcitonin. That means if you are seeing a high level of procal, it means the patient has either bacteria infection or high cytokines or maybe a microbicidal toxins. Okay, one thing is clear. Now let's come back to the normal thing. Dekho. Normally, see, normally PCT is not found in the circulation. Normally it's not found. But if you find a PCT increasing, it suggests the patient has a bacterial inflammation, especially bacterial infection, inflammation. Why? Because it's done by lipopolysaccharides and some cytokines. So what happens? Look at this basic thing. A patient will always be started on antibiotics if his procal level is more than 0.5. So understand and remember this value. A value of procal of more than 0.5 microgram per liter. I repeat it here. A value of procal more than 0.5 microgram per liter is often an indication to start antibiotics. If the value is more than 0.5, start antibiotics. If the value is more than 1, the patient is going towards sepsis. A patient is having more than 8 has already gone towards septic syndrome. Has already gone towards septic syndrome. It will always go towards septic syndrome. Now what happens? See here. So what you expect is the procal to getting increased. The procal getting increased will be treated by antibiotics, right? So now tell me what is the importance of doing procal levels in COVID infection? One of the very important indicators is to exclude bacterial pneumonia in these patients. See, a patient got admitted with COVID-19 infection. He was in the hospital for say 14 days and now he is having a deterioration of the symptoms. That means he's having more and more oxygen requirement. Now you are in a doubt whether it is due to cytokine storm or it is due to the bacterial pneumonia. How let's do this? We'll let's do this by doing a procal level. A procal level high will point towards a bacterial pneumonia. A procal level being normal will point towards a cytokine storm. A cytokine storm is treated by high dose steroids. And if you, get, if you give steroids or tocilizumab in a case of cytokine storm, it is good. But if you do the opposite thing, you give this in a patient who is having bacterial pneumonias, it will actually flare up the entire inflammation. It will actually flare up the entire inflammation. Okay. So, uh, is there any way a pro calcitonin and viral pneumonias infection related to the other cytokine release? Actually, yes. See, a pro cal can be seen also with a high level of interleukins. But, 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 a pro cal is seen in 9-10% cases with a bacterial infection only, especially bacterial lipopolysaccharide, not due to a non-specific viral uh, infection, not due to viral, non-specific viral in, in, in infection. Okay, now see. About LDH. LDH is a marker which actually is an enzyme. Why does LDH increase? See, lymphocyte destruction or direct use of tissue damage from the microorganism will inflammation or tissue ischemia can increase the LDH. So LDH increases because of the lymphocyte destruction or direct tissue damage from the microorganisms. So the moment the lung has any sort of destruction, lung tissue getting destructed will definitely increase the LDH levels. Normal LDH is 140 to 280. LDH is one marker which is not very uh, commonly used. But yes, some clinicians actually depend on LDH to look for the progressive worsening of the pulmonary symptoms. Okay. Why? Because more the damage to the alveolus, more LDH comes to the, into the blood circulation and it's a fairly good indicator that the patient is having some um, the worsening of the symptoms. So often it's not very commonly done marker. But yes, some Clinicians often depend on LDH for increasing the value as to with the correlating with the high oxygen requirements. Uh, cytokine storm PCT should increase, right, sir? Cytokine storm may increase a PCT, but please understand 
if a patient has a PCT, please remember to me carefully, if a patient has a PCT value of more than 2, it is mainly pointing towards bacterial pneumonias rather than towards cytokine storm. So to look for cytokine storm, what you must do? Can we come now come to the conclusion? See, if you want to look for the cytokine storm, try to look for values like cytokine storm. How will you look at? Try to do some markers like CRP, peritin and interleukin-6 to exclude bacterial pneumonia try to do try to do the procal so to, if it is going towards cytokine storm this will be increased if going towards bacterial pneumonia this will be increased now if you say sir will a patient having this have increase in this it can be but the value of procal will not be so high as it may increase to over more than two a value of more than two often points towards bacterial sepsis rather than towards cytokine storm so is it clear is it clear? Is ferritin uh, uh, must to do? Definitely not. Ferritin is not a specific marker for any sort of inflammation. So you may actually exclude the ferritin. But if you're doing ferritin, make sure you know an implication of ferritin, why it has increased in the patient. So now look at the other thing. A patient who is having the covid infection often also has caritis, which is often seen in the abnormal ECG phenomenon that means the patient can have ventricular tachycardia he may have abnormal rhythms and it often happens because of myocarditis the basic way you can find out myocarditis is look for the ck level creatinine kinase and ckmb levels look for the pro bnp levels the pro bnp will tell you if a patient is going towards ccf a high pro bnp will look pay look, will ask or you will actually point towards a patient going towards congestive cardiac failure similarly nt pro bnp is a very new marker it is more specific molecule of the pro BNP, which looks for especially increasing in the uh, marker in congestive cardiac failure. So if you want to do a two test of normal pro BNP or anti pro BNP, oh, please, please go for anti pro BNP. It's a N terminal pro BNP, a special marker, which is actually a micro molecule of the pro BNP, which is increased in a congestive cardiac failure. So suppose a patient comes to the emergency, he has supposedly a dyspnea. You are thinking about covid infection. You do a pro BNP and the pro BNP is high. You think towards a patient having congestive cardiac failure. So you should understand the basic implications of these markers. A high pro BNP will take you towards congestive cardiac failure, maybe not in a case of covid infection. Why is IL-6 selected as an interleukin? Because it's a more available test. I'm not saying IL-1 and t level is not a good indicator. They also are. But in laboratory investigations, IL-6 is readily available. And so we do that test. But yes, the higher end laboratories can definitely do IL-1 also and may also be able to do TNF. They're very costly, but they are definitely, definitely done. They're surely done. Okay. So in conclusion, so what is my conclusion? In my conclusion, what I will tell you is when you're diagnosing a case of covid infection, start with CBC. Start with CBC. Okay. Then in the inflammation, do CRP and ESR. If a patient is going towards high requirement of oxygen, do D dimer. These marker will tell you LDH, raised AST, raised ALT, and low albumin will tell you again will just support the other. Uh, comorbid conditions that means a patient has liver dysfunction or he has kidney dysfunction can be looked into by these markers if a patient you want to look for the pronostic indication for prognosis understand there can be leukocytosis neutropenia lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia the thrombocytopenia in a patient is pointed towards poor prognosis remember this marker is pointed towards especially poor prognosis a high dimer and increased fibrinogen is pointed towards poor prognosis CRP is only for evaluating a patient or looking for the high and low thing. But remember, a high level of CRP of more than 100 is surely more than 100 is high indicator of very, very poor prognosis, very poor prognosis. Similarly, increased procal talks about bacterial sepsis or pneumonias or pneumonias. And other marker is again the same. You can do the back end analysis to look for the patient going into the cytokine storm also. Yes. Caritis is definitely, definitely an, a finding you expect in COVID-19 infections. Patients have been shown to have ventral tachycardias after getting into the 
uh, into the ICUs. And how you look into it? You do the CK, you do the CKMB, and look for the pro BNP levels also. So, what is my, uh, I'll say, uh, conclusion here? Try to understand when is a marker increasing. Initially, try to do a CBC and ESR and do the CRP for establishing your baseline. If a patient is not worsening, look for the CRP on day 7 and then on day 14 to look for the patient's condition. If the patient is worsening or is having some amount of decrease in SpO2, try to go for DMR analysis. You can also do ferritin. A increase in LDH will always correlate with the worsening symptoms, especially the permanent symptoms. If you want to go for dimer, you will not find the PT helping you a lot. But an increase in dimer is often seen with the high fibrinogen levels also. Always look for the other investigations to be done in a patient who is having comorbid conditions like try to do a kidney function test or liver function test if you want to exclude the involvement of other organs in here also. A pro-cal level should be done only if a patient has a suspicion of bacterial pneumonia. But if a patient has bacterial pneumonia, the pro-cal level being high, do not think about cytokine storm, treat him with high dose of antibiotics, maybe give him polymaxin B. But if a patient has a low pro-cal level and has very high level of IL-6, CRP, ferritin, dimer, the patient is going towards cytokine storm. So if you know these parameters, I am very sure you will be able to treat the patient well, you will understand what is going on in the patient and that will help in a better outcome for your patients as well. Can there be risk of thromboembolism? A bit low, but yes, thromboembolism can occur if there is extensive coagulation cascade activation in these patients. So that's what is from my side guys. The inf inflammation is quite, uh, I'll say severe, but if you know these markers well, I'm very sure you'll understand the disease process and it will help you a lot and lot in treating your patients. Any doubts that you have, let me please put on the telegram on the group here and I'll be able to explain you in a better format. Now the whole uh, class is open. I'll not say class, but the discussion is open for your inputs and any discussion that we can actually have. Is ECMO the last option? ECMO is res actually reserved for very last option. It's an extra corporal membrane oxygenation, a highly, highly high end machine which takes all the blood out, oxygenates outside, and put the blood inside. So that is actually a very high end machine and is actually put as, yes, more or less last resort only. How do we interpret a RT PCR report? See, RT PCR report in India is done by looking for some gene analysis. So often we look for the RDRP gene and the spike protein or the S gene. So what is seen is a CT report, a CT, uh, CT value is often seen. CT value is just like, suppose I tell you, uh, any, suppose I treat, I'm just explaining to you one time and understanding it. That means I told you once and you understood it. But suppose I tell you 10 times and then you understand it. Then my way of teaching is not very good. Similarly, a CT value of high, what does it mean is, Suppose a patient has a CT value of 30. It means after 30 cycles, the virus was captured by fluorescent emission. But if a CT value is say 15, that means after just 15 amplifications, the virus got amplified. What is bad? A CT value of 15 is bad because even just after 15 uh, amplification, you could detect the virus. So low CT value is having high viral load. High CT value is having low viral load. Is it clear? So thanks Preeti for, uh, for your really inspiring uh, statement. Telegram link. Okay, I'll just share. Can any of any of my students please share my telegram link here? It's very easy for me. Neri has invented a new technique of taking simple a uh, saline gargle. How does this method eliminate the extraction of RNA? See, uh, that method is not very well followed in the most of the laboratories. We often go for an automated uh, RNA extraction, else the values is not very, very collaborative with the patient's status. N gene, E gene and RT-PCR mean, because these all are genes in the virus. N is the neuraminidase gene, E is the envelope gene, and P is the, sorry, uh, S is the spike protein gene. So these all genes are in the virus which codes for the corresponding proteins. And so what does virus do? See, what, is the, what does virus do? The virus enters our body, uses our 
बॉडीज राइबोसोम एंड एंडो प्लास्टमिक रेटिकुलम टू मेक द वायरल प्रोटीन सो इफ द वायरस हैज मेड इफ द वायरस हैज मेड इट्स ओन पी जीन और एस जीन or n gene it means the virus has basically amplified its own gene that is the reason we look for these genes especially the s gene spike gene look for n gene durable s gene e gene envelope gene and the rdrv proteins also if anemia is there then should we not give rn substitutes a uh, giving rn substitutes will actually increase inflammation so often it is said to withhold rn at the point of high inflammation in the patient it is often true because high rn can lead to high ros and can lead to more and more cell death why rt pcr is turning negative if a patient has covid um, i'm not saying it is due to mutation one of the basic reason of rt pcr getting negative is not taking the sample properly number one second the virus often is seen to be multiplying not at the oropharyngeal area or the nasal vaginal area is multiplying quite low in the area that means it's mostly multiplying in the uh, lung area and therefore we see a negative rt pcr report even the patient comes out to be later on rt pcr positive so number one reason not taking the sample properly and second reason being the patient uh, virus is multiplying not in the upper uh, area that is the oropharyngeal nasal vaginal area quite deep into the lungs uh, is ferritin linked to the mucopycosis not exactly Uh, why is crp coming low and then rising again in few patients because the cytokine onset may be quite late in the patients it is now seen the cytokine storm can occur even after 14 days of the in in the of the infection so make sure you always look into the crp levels even after the patient has completely got normalized maybe a crp repetition after 7 days of fever free interval is a good way of looking into the facts how do you interpret the ct values you will have to give it 25 And few are less than thirty six. Good question. So CT value basically depends on the kit that the patient that the lab is using. Most of the lab will always tell you with the CT value what is their interpretation. So according to my laboratories, my laboratory will take a CT value of say more than thirty, as uh, more than thirty five as negative, and value of more less than fifteen as very very high viral load. In between them, we look for the moderate viral load there. So, guys, any other question that you have, let me know. Any other question that you have, I think that we can make it more and more interactive just by your questioning. I'm really, I'm really liking the way that you are asking my questions because it will really help you to understand the basic disease. Regarding the hyperglycemia in COVID-19 non-diabetic patients, yes, a good question. So, it is seen, it's always true that high glucose level will cause glucotoxicity. The high glucose level will damage the inflammatory cells. that means the high glucose level will not only damage the body organs but will also damage the neutrophils lymphocytes and release of cytokines because of low release of cytokines the patient always have a less uh, way or i can say less um, less uh, propensity to fight with the infection of the patient so high glucose level a fasting glucose level high fasting glucose level irrespective of the patient being diabetic or not is often seen with high morbidity and mortality in the patients what are the tests to be advised for sir finally so i think we have made it clear on the day of diagnosis that is you have got rtp sir positive go for cvc esr crp if a patient is having a oxygen requirement do a dimer test and ferritin if you can if it is available you can also go for ldh if you find a high level of crp go for interleukin 6 levels because it is not really available in most of the areas so what uh, clinicians do is they go for baseline test for all of these investigations but if you are a smart clinician and the laboratories at least support your diagnosis they can definitely be done after few days what is the role of vitamin d in covid treatment Yeah, uh, vitamin D is one way of uh, looking into the facts because it's seen that it actually decreases the reactive oxygen species and increases or boosts the body immunity. No, we don't use creatinine agents not because of their high toxicity levels. It is not shown to seem to be more beneficial. So the uh, benefit of using uh, RN creatinine agents is not very high and has not used for treating the patients. So I think that's it. for my side yes uh, is uh, methylprednisolone and dexa major causes will lead to microbiosis uh, may be true
I will not comment on this unless I have not read the papers. So unless the paper comes out, one may be one of the cause, may be a high rampant use of uh, pregnancy that has been done. It's quite possible there also. The serious symptoms of COVID are stroke, mostly stroke. And why? Because of thrombosis. So everything can lead to thrombosis and thrombosis can lead to damage to any organ. It can lead to ATN, it can lead to the uh, stroke, it can lead to the MI, but because of high coagulopathies to, that happen the disease. Post viral syndrome, nothing specific. Just go for the inflammatory markers again and look how your patient has done or has actually surpassed the entire thing. Go for a CRP, go for a CBC and ESR and definitely go for DMR levels. It was actually high in the previous investigation that you actually had. Now, none of the other markers will help you a lot. Doing this investigation will actually help you and nothing more needs to be done. If the patient is quite well and is having fever free symptoms now. Okay, so I think that's it from my side. I hope you like the lecture and and uh, the entire um, like that uh, entire doubt session that we had. If you really liked it, please share this video with your friends and do not forget to like the video. It will help really help me to uh, make your lesson more and more. So anyone who is watching the video, please make an attempt to like the video and share with all your friends who actually are working in a, a COVID setup and they want to know about the inflammatory markers. In this way, we will be able to make more and more videos and make you understand the basic pathophysiology disease and make you understand the laboratory findings because I'm very sure you can read pathophysiology, but knowing our diagnostic tests, it's not very really easy for you as a student or as a practitioner. So very thank you to all of you for giving you valuable time. Uh, make sure that you like the video and please share the video with most of your friends who are actually working in the COVID scenario. Thank you. God bless you all. Stay happy, stay blessed and most importantly, stay safe. Bye-bye.